Good evening, afternoon, night, morning, wherever you find a watcher, listen to this podcast. It is me, Omar, and we are continuing our march with the with the guest uh, guest host of Hardware. Uh, now that Jackson's continuing to enjoy his his wedding from Paris, I mean Jackson is a more dedicated man than I am because he he told me he was going to wake up at one thirty local time in Paris just to watch Florida play McNeese State. And this weekend was also our cupcake game against Delaware State. And like once Army went up thirty six nothing at halftime, I was like, "Yep, I don't I don't need to see any more." So Jackson is a way more dedicated man than I am. I'm joined by Bobby Wilson of, of the TNT College Football Podcast, a good friend of mine who's been on many, many times. So man, I even feel like a guest appearance, but it's just a guest appearance with like different or not even guest appearance, just a podcast with different branding featuring Bobby. Well, thanks, Omar. That that's it's always a pleasure to be with you. And I enjoy our friendship. I enjoy talking football, college football with you. And uh hats off to uh <laughs> for for waking up at at, at 1 30 in Paris to watch Florida against McNeese State I, the, the one thing I'll say about that game I did notice the McNeese State uh team and equipment people cleaned up the locker room tremendously tied to the garbage bags and everything I actually serve as a janitor at my local high school for my current job so kudos to McNeese State for that as somebody who does that for a living it's uh I, I love seeing that that's awesome yeah, I, I saw that too. I saw you. Make, I didn't know that was McNeese State. I mean, I didn't know that was the, that's probably the most noteworthy thing to come from that game. If we're yes. being honest, no, <laughs> no events to McNeese State, but yeah, cute kudos to them. Always great to see. I mean, just well coached, like just great culture and programs too. Especially mm-hmm. with, I'm not gonna elaborate further on some of the news that came out over the weekend, but especially you oh, know with some man. of the news that came out. Um, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm sure if you're watching when we release this, you know what we're talking about. But I'm just glad that that just you know took front front and center. But um, Jackson, again, hope you're having fun. Um, you know, hope you're enjoying it. Can't wait to have you back on. But meanwhile, you're missing. Well, I don't think he's missing. Yeah, you're missing a lot of great college football right now on your honeymoon. But for good reason. Um, just so many, just just another great weekend. Just like all like all over the country, like group of five and even FCS as well. FCS had some mm-hmm. like amazing games. Um, most like notably the, the the mini game of the century, South Dakota State, Montana State. Then you had some up, you had a, a huge upset too uh, in the FCS level. Um, Sanford lost the top 10 team, lost by three touchdowns. But that being said, just so much great football and so much to talk about in this podcast, which I mean, we're here for the awards races. But before we begin, we're going to begin our customary uh, HBCU Players of the Week. And for me, I had mine pulled up. Let's see if the app is still open. But this weekend, we had the battle by the bay between Norfolk State and Hampton. And surprisingly, Hampton had a national TV appearance last week uh, in the Brick City Classic in in Newark. They beat Grambling decisively. And the story from that game was Christopher Zells having over 100 yards rushing, looking very dynamic in a, honestly, a Hampton system that's been fun for a couple of years. Uh, Otto Coons outdueled Christopher Zells this weekend. He had three touchdowns on 15 to 20 passing over 199 yards. Very efficient. And Norfolk State, I've been a fan of their system. Uh, or I guess their program not not their program but i mean I, i've been a fan of the players they put out especially the quarterback position a couple years ago was jawan carter a man who got a uh a spot in the hbcu legacy bowl um very dynamic and fun to watch i'm just hoping he gets a chance i'm not sure what his status is in the pros but i'm hoping he gets a chance at any level because he's very fun to watch he was while well, he was very fun to watch and now Otto coons following that same tradition and this is just a surprising result considering Nor- norfolk state lost to virginia state the uh the week before um and then now they beat a CAA team so I don't know it's kind of shaping like a 2007 type year in the FCS you know it seems kind of crazy to me so uh Bobby uh who is your HBCU player of the week well you you shouted out a D2 team beating an FCS program there I want to shout out um uh Miles College another D2 team upsetting Alabama State uh I'm a former D2 uh member I went to Grand Valley State was a part of the basketball team there so I I always love supporting the D2 teams, but <clears throat> I, I, I had a huff, tough time going between FAMU's quarterback uh, who threw for 374 yards, albeit in a losing effort to USF. Um, so I'm going to go with Alabama A&M's running back. Ryan Morrow had 191 yards, three touchdowns against Lane College, had 10.6 yards per carry. So uh, it'll be interesting to see how the SWAC unfolds this year with with the of course coach prime is gone so probably a little bit more open now than what it's been so it'll be interesting to see how that all unfolds and uh just a 
I, I know Alabama and M's AD very well. I worked with him at a previous coaching spot that I had. So I'm cheering for those guys. That's that's amazing. I mean, uh, Connell Maynard he has a fun system out there um, out, out at Huntsville. Um, it's it's just surprising, you know, um, just the rushing numbers because Akil Glass is a guy that's um, caught on, on in the USFL. Really, I really think he deserves a, an NFL shot. So I hope he gets a starting job in the USFL to show, uh, you know, what he can do. But, you know, uh, the Bulldogs doing it on the ground. Maybe that's due to them playing Lane College, a D2 school. But, right. the dra- yeah, like the Dragons beat Tennessee State last year. So, you know, they, they are no slouch. Right. Got to give him credit. And and I agree with you. I, I think Akil Glass deserves an opportunity. He was a really, really good football player at, at the FCS level there at Alabama AM. and m And I, I really think that he could do, given an opportunity, I think he could do some good things. Exactly. I mean, a lot of these guys just need like just time to play like at mm-hmm. any level, like EJ Perry. Uh, the Michigan yes. Panthers is a huge example. He yep. was electrifying in the last two games of the season. Like, so I, I feel like a quill glass can do a, a something similar next year in the USFL. I already can't wait for the summer. For me, that's that's the real football football returning for me when the USFL returns. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but that being said, I really grew to I really grew to like that over the over the spring. I I, I, I enjoyed it. I thought it was fun. Yeah, exactly. Like it, it, it's just it's just fun football, honestly. And it's like I feel like just not really having an investment into the teams like makes it more mm-hmm. enjoyable. Like you're just watching football and it's like not like I'm not worrying about oh man, like is this the year the Niners or the Lions like does it and everything? Like, you know, is this our year? I'm just like watching football for the sake of watching yes. football. So yes. I think that just adds to the fun of it. Uh but that that being said, I I'm moving on to the main topic of our discussion. Um, this week again, you know, we're, we're still trying to figure out who's going to win the September Heisman, who's going to have the 2012 Geno Smith like run. And I think, well, I mean, that's the first one that comes to mind in terms of September Heisman, but the race is wide open, obviously. And, uh, I mean, I, I just kind of want to bring some, some, I guess, some like discussion into like your perspectives on, I guess, narratives, because like I always say with Jackson is like, who are the, who are the people that votes on these, these, uh, on these awards writers, what do writers create? They create narratives. And sadly, the stats don't drive the awards. Most of the times it's the narratives that drives the awards. So first off, I feel like this is probably what every prognosticator for the Heisman Trophy races. This is the guy that they, that they kind of are pointing towards Shador Sanders. Like, do you, wh- what do you think about, I guess, his season so far? Cause his season's been Heisman caliber, but his path to the Heisman going forward. Well, first off, I'll say I, I knew he was good, but I didn't realize he was this good. I mean, he, he has got, he's a special talent. And of, of course the name and everything, what he has to carry. I, I, I give him a ton of credit for that. Uh, having to carry that family name that he has. I mean, obviously his dad is the best defensive back arguably to ever play. So, I mean, you you got a lot to live up to when it comes to that. He's doing a heck of a job right now. And when it comes to like his future looking forward, I mean, the PAC 12, (laughs) it's crazy to think that this isn't going to be a conference anymore after this season, but it's the best conference in college football right now. I mean, there's, I believe six teams ranked now. It's it's actually eight. I saw eight. a graphic that eight okay. teams are ranked. That that's incredible. I mean, it, it, that's it, it, there is some really really good football being played in the Pac-12. So obviously he's going to be going week in week out coming up coming up against really really good football teams and and great quarterbacks too. With say I mean Caleb Williams, Bo Nix, uh, Michael Penix Jr. And, and you can go down the line. I mean, there's DJ Ugangale. Some really, really good quarterbacks in that conference, and he's going to be going up against them every single week. Yeah, I I agree. And like my thing was too is like I I think Colorado is a great story. I think they have showed us a lot of improvement. But something I thought about too is like the 2018 Colorado team that started off five and zero and proceeded to lose seven straight. And I'm not wishing that on the Buffaloes, but I I just think we're quick to forget, you know, stuff like that, like with the with the program, which I don't think it's going to happen, but I know Shador Sanders is a it's a, he's a, he's a great story. You know, we we both knew that he was good. You know, but it was kind of like the uh like how would he adjust to the to the move up to uh to FBS? Mm-hmm. Some quarterbacks adjust well, other quarterbacks not so much. Um, he's at, taking it in stride. 
But like you said, there's so many great quarterbacks where I feel like, you know, I think I, I don't know if it's the first time ever, but I kind of feel like the Heisman race kind of feels like, you know, an elimination tournament through the Pac-12 with all these games, particularly maybe for Sh- Shador Sanders, uh, but maybe for the guys he faces, because I, I see Oregon in a couple weeks and then the week after that, USC. Uh, and then further down the line, you have, like you said, DJ Uyangalale. Uh, they play Oregon State in the first week of November. Then don't forget about Cameron Ward, too, like Cameron Ward in that Washington State system. Um, so I feel like there's I feel like there's plenty of opportunities for Colorado to slip. And I think Sanders will have a great year. Uh, I don't know how many yards he has exactly. I think he so 903. I think 5,000 yards is definitely within reach and that that's a great mm-hmm. season. But as for Heisman, uh, if he, if he's not able to bring Colorado, well, I, I shouldn't say he, because one person doesn't lose a game, but if Colorado isn't able to pull out those wins against Oregon and Bo Nix, uh, Caleb Williams and USC and the like, I, I, I don't see him being a Heisman winner, even really a finalist. If, if, you know, Colorado drops those games. Right. No, I mean, they they probably got to win ten games that you you would think to even be considered because it, it it seems like the Heisman's turn into especially recently, not necessarily the best player on the best team, but the best player on the better team with a better record. I know that's that kind of a weird way to say it, but I, I think he's it, comparing it to these other guys where his numbers how close are they going to be to Caleb Williams? How close are they going to be to Bo Nix? If you're looking at it that way, it's going to boil down to, I believe who has the better record out of those guys. Yeah, I I think so too. And also the head to head matchups as as well. And I guess how, um, and not just stats too, like you say, like the record as well, like, uh, cause it, we could very well see uh, Shador Sanders throw for more yards than Bo Nix or Caleb Williams mm-hmm. win those games. But, you know, granted, it could be a situation where Colorado is down by four scores in the second half and they're throwing the ball on every play. So um, I, I think I feel like it would be a combination of the two, like you like you say. Uh, but I mean, again, like I said, like 5000 yards is definitely within reach for Sanders mm-hmm. this year and would be an amazing year for him. I mean, definitely Pac-12 newcomer of the year. Uh, oh, 100 you know, honors for sure. Well, <laughs> If if Travis Hunter doesn't win it, <laughs> that's, I mean, a that, that, that's, <laughs> that's a good point. That's a good point. But uh, but yeah, that speaking of Travis Hunter, I mean, we know that the Heisman is a, is a quarterback award. I'm going to come back to the Pac-12's quarterbacks after this, but we know that the, that the Heisman is a quarterback award. Other than Travis Hunter, are there any like non quarterbacks that have like stood up to, that have uh, stood out to you? Excuse me, stood out to you early in the season. I, I first just want to give him some credit for what he's doing many snaps as he plays in modern day college football is nothing short of amazing really i mean that kudos to him man that's you're playing 120 plus snaps a game and high level the highest level you can play that's not the nfl or usfl i mean just an amazing job by him i I guess if i'm looking at some running backs that could win because I, I really don't think a wide receiver can win this year. Marvin Harrison had a ter- not a very good game against Indiana, and Indiana's awful. So I think he's pretty much much out already, and he's probably the only wide out of out of the wide receivers. So I mean, I look at Blake Cormitt, Michigan. I think last year, if he didn't get hurt, I th- I think there's an argument to be made that he would have won the Heisman. Uh, would have been, would have been really really close to 2,000 yards rushing, but this year Donovan Edwards taking a lot of his carries. So th- I I don't know if he can realistically get back up there, especially with the cupcake schedule Michigan ha- has, especially to start the season. So his numbers aren't great by any means. But I do want to give a shout out to uh, Audric Estime from Notre Dame. He he's putting up some great numbers, eight yards per carry. Uh, the only issue he has is Sam Hartman can take away some of his votes. Sam Hartman, I mean, what a, he's doing a heck of a job, and he's such a likable guy. I don't know if you saw the clip, Omar, of him waiting for uh, NC State's alma mater to finish playing, but I'm a former coach, head coach at the college level, and I, I respect the heck out of that. that I, I love seeing that. 
Yeah, I mean, you say that. I thought so. I honestly thought the academies were the only ones that stayed for alma maters, you know, that yeah. uh, that did the whole alma mater thing. So that's that's great to hear, you know. I mean, because uh, I, I know I know the drill. I, I know the drill, and I'm sure like you've seen, you know, at the end of a you know even our army army cupcake game, it, it could it could be the most the most um mini school victory, you know. They'll still show like them standing in front of the the core cadets, you know, singing the alma mater um but yeah that's that's just great yeah sam hartman is yeah extremely likable and everything um honestly he's like he's like my friend's favorite quarterback my, my best friend but yeah like uh, you took the words out of my mouth because i'm I'm a big audrick Estime fan for me he just kind of reminds me of like that old school kind of like notre dame running back in like the 80s absolutely and 80s. like it, he, he's a call to the past like he's like and they've had great running backs before like they you know kyron williams um De dexter or sorry Ky I forget Kyron Williams' last name, but yeah, you know, uh, from 2020. Yeah. 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 Uh, Dexter, yeah. Dexter Williams, and then uh, Darius, Darius Walker from when I was a kid. Plenty of great running backs, but he just has like a throwback feel with like the way that he runs. He runs mm -hmm. like, you know, with bad intentions. Uh, but like you said, Sam Hartman, you know, taking taking those votes away from him, which if you're a Notre Dame fan, like that, that's not a bad thing at all. But if you're a running back right. enthusiast, it's a very bad thing because <laughs> – <laughs> estimate looks amazing and but it's his carry yeah like you said eight yards to carry his carry load is just not high at all um so sa same thing with blake blake corm and i know i said last week when uh with uh brock uh, on, on the pot on this podcast uh brock last week's guest so it was really like the worst thing that could have happened for blake corm was donovan edwards having yep. a legendary performance last year against ohio state so like they know how capable is but like granted michigan could be saving him for when they need him most right because you know you know, UNLV, 15 carries against UNLV, you, you don't need, arguably that's too much. Even 15 carries may be right. too much for him against an opponent like UNLV. So I'm still holding out hope for Blake Quorum. And like, it's not like he's putting up bad yardage, like 80 and 73 in those two games. Like that's, that's definitely great total. Um, I mean, not great, but very solid totals. Mm -hmm. But Travis Hunter, um, I mean, I think, I think it's the same thing as Audrey Gastame and uh, Sam Hartman, you know, mm -hmm. or, Shador Sanders would take some of his votes from him. But like you said, like I, I think I think it's great because the last time we had a two-way finalist was Jabril Peppers. But I, yeah. I just think it's funny how at how um you know he's like the how Travis Hunter is like one of the centerpieces of Colorado's offense, while Jabril Peppers would come in every every now and then and take a yeah, wild yeah. cap and jog <laughs> off the field. Like it's just funny comparing the two. Absolutely. I mean, I, I... I grew up a diehard Michigan fan and Charles Woodson was my first like real his Heisman moment against Ohio state was my first recollection of being at a college football game and just being like, this is unbelievable. And like when he hit the Heisman against Ohio state, like that was the first thing that like first time in my life where I was, I'm like 10 years old at the time. And it's like, wow, this is special. And, and so uh, and, and, and again, like Charles Woodson did, doesn't even play remotely close to the, as many snaps as Travis Hunter does. That's, the, that's what the most amazing thing is too, is like Travis Hunter is literally on the field the entire game. It's, it's really amazing. Yeah, I, I agree. And like, I mean, just, you just go down the line with like every, like kind of, you know, gimmicky two-way player we had, like mm -hmm. even Jack Coletto, who um, I, I don't know if he made the final roster cuts for the Niners, but I know he caught a touchdown in the preseason. Uh, Jack Coletto too, you know, linebacker, he took wildcat snaps like that. It was just yeah. a wildcat thing. Like, you know, it was, it was just a gimmick. So Travis Hunter, like not a gimmick, uh, the real deal, which like, I kind of, I kind of wonder too, like when the coaches like make those schemes, like, do they think about like the press attention is going to get when you like scheme in a linebacker as a wildcat quarterback? I don't really think about that, but <laughs> you know, <laughs> the the one other thing I want to say about Travis Hunter, I just pray that he stays healthy because oh, yeah. he's so good for college football. I mean, he is unbelievably talented and I, to play that many snaps, you just, I, I really do. I just pray that he stays healthy. Exactly. And I, and I do want to mention like the last player that, of his type that we saw on the national scale was a uh, Gordy Lockbaum from the eighties, oh, uh, Holy Cross. <laughs> so he, he's, he's Gordy Lockbaum nowadays. So uh, I'm surprised Holy Cross Twitter isn't, isn't coming out in droves and saying, Hey, you know, Gordy Lockbaum did it before uh, Travis Hunter. If there even is a Holy Cross Twitter to, uh, that's amazing. <laughs> to shout into the void. <laughs> that is that, that... There is may I I can't tell you if there's a Holy Cross Twitter much, but I will say that their performance this weekend was phenomenal, and that is a really really good football team that they have. 
it was almost too good because now uh now coach bob chesney will probably be coaching somewhere else next year <laughs> so it's almost too good in that aspect <laughs> yeah probably probably boston college <laughs> if anything which oh man like boston college i was so high on them in 2020 i mean Me I, too. I, I, I like i almost feel like the turning point was when they blew that lead. You know, I yes. think looking back in like point to like one moment when they blew that lead against Clemson, I really feel like that might have been the turning point of, of the Jeff of the Jeff Halfley tenure, which it's sad to say that you can pinpoint it to one. Even though there were cool moments like like uh, now like every now and then. Like uh I think I remember when uh Phil Jacoby came back from injury and then Boston College did the whole Michael the 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 thing that everyone does when someone comes back from something, the whole Michael Jordan press release thing, which like it's just getting overplayed <laughs> now. Like it, right. it's just, it's just you know, it's not creative anymore. Right, but, you know, they, they did that. So, uh, that being said, speak going back to quarterbacks and the Pac-12, I think we both agree that the the front runner for the Heisman is a quarterback from the Pac-12. Whether you think it's Caleb Williams or Michael Penix, who do you think has like the upper hand in the Pac-12, like right now, uh, for the Heisman race? Like Caleb Williams and, and USC, like they're not. They're they're winning comfortably, and it's not making headlines. But you can't deny that Caleb Williams looks set for a second Heisman, which I'm kind of inclined to, to think that he's a front runner. Even though, like, I had Michael Penix as my preseason Heisman pick. I gotta agree with you, and and I think USC is doing a really good job with this, like keep going really really low key, and not really pushing the Heisman back to back Heisman thing with uh, Caleb Williams because I think if they do it too early and he lose, they lose a game that they quote unquote shouldn't lose or something like that, or he has a bad performance, he's basically going to get locked out. So I, I really like what USC is doing when it comes to that, just really lay low, let Caleb Williams ball out. Like he's doing, he's doing a tremendous job, uh, great numbers, albeit not, not the best opponents, obviously, but he can only play who you're playing and he's doing a heck of a job when he does it. And I like you, Omar, th- uh, the preseason said Michael Penix Jr. And the, the numbers he's put up uh, in the two games he's played are really, really impressive. Uh, that performance he had against Boise State, I, I that that I give him a ton of credit for that because Boise State coming into that game, we all thought, I mean, I know you have you were very, very high on them, and I, I was as well. I I I thought they'd finish first or second in the Mountain West, and they still very well could do that. I mean, that's it's definitely definitely possible but i'm i'm intrigued to see him against michigan state this weekend not that michigan state is a juggernaut team anymore by any means but that physicality that the big 10 has i'm interested to see how he's able and and they're going on the road almost across the country to east lansing i'm hoping to maybe attend that game we'll see i'm going to the detroit lions game on sunday so I'm, i'm trying to see what i can do there but that's a side note but uh <laughs> but I'm, I'm really intrigued to see him going up against that physical big 10 defense and he did a heck of a job against them last year and michigan state was probably better last year it's hard to tell michigan state hasn't played great competition yet so they're they're undefeated but we'll see uh, obviously there's some huge issues going on there but we don't need to go into that as we as we've discussed already but I think that they'll, I think Michigan state will come out energized and and you know how, how teams kind of bond together when there's coaching changes or issues or whatever it may be. And I could see Sparty doing that. And I'm and and East Lansing is a tough place to play when that stadium's rocking. And I think that could be the case. I mean, it's obviously nothing that he's not used to playing in great competition in the PAC 12, but just intrigued to see this as it's a different type of atmosphere and opponent than what he's, what they're used to playing. It's not that shootout Pac-12 style. Yeah, I, I'd have to agree. I mean, the physicality for sure, but I mean, you know, Washington better get used to that physicality because that's, right. that's going to be the new, <laughs> that's the new thing. <laughs> yeah. That, that's as, as, as much as I hate to say it, like, you know, that that's going to be the norm. And it's funny you mentioned going to that game because you can just catch it in like a few years. You know, it's not like I know it's crazy. It's, it's crazy to think. <laughs> it's uh oh well, you know they'll they'll right. come to they'll come back in twenty twenty six or whatever. It's so crazy. <laughs> it's yeah. It, it it's called it's college football now. But I I do like that point, and and I mean I kind of wonder like uh, whether it's better to I guess 
not just from a playoff perspective, from a Heisman perspective, like build up on these like, you know, performances where, hey, we put up 49 in the first half against like Stanford, even though it's not an that's not a non conference. So I guess a better example would be like, hey, like put up big numbers against Nevada if you're um if you're Caleb Williams, you know, or like Bo Nix, we we dropped eighty one on Portland State and someone lost their ear. Um I, I don't know if you heard about that story. That's crazy. That <laughs> that's was, crazy. <laughs> yeah, I listened to that in horror. I was like, wow. Um, you know, it kind of made me feel bad for being a football fan at that point. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, like performances like that or just like like uh like Michael Penix Jr. go to you know Michigan State and like maybe not have as great a performance as you would, but still have like very respectable numbers. So I kinda I kind of mm-hmm. wonder what's like the better, what's the better um situation, you know, in that case. I I think voters will tend especially with this game being more on the east coast and and i think we all agree that there is a bias i shouldn't say we agree i think we know there's a bias and that that's the crazy thing this year about the all these quarterbacks in the pac-12 that that it really seems like it's kind of i don't want to say set already but it just really seems like it's going to be a quarterback from the pac-12 and as we all know, a lot of these Heisman voters don't stay awake to see those Pac-12 games. So I, I really think that this game against Michigan State could really do some great things for him because he's playing on the East Coast. In in a prime slot, they're playing on Peacock, I want to say it, for Central Time, I think is what it is. So, I mean, that's a like good that, – yeah. it's a good slot for, like, voters to watch. Yeah, it is unique. And you mentioned the Peacock. I wondered, like – I don't know how many people are bought into Peacock as a sports platform. Like I, I haven't yeah. seen any streaming numbers, but this is actually like a game that people, I, I mean, people would subscribe to like watch right. Peacock. Like, I mean, that it's, it's not a paycheck game. Like it's not Delaware Penn State, even though I thought that one would have been way closer than, than right. what actually happened. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> but that's the worst thing that could have happened. I think for Peacock, like, because that just kind of solidifies the belief where, where it's like, we, I don't need to subscribe to watch. I don't need to pay seven bucks a month to watch Penn State beat Delaware by 56. It's, it's just not worth it. Right. But, That's a good point. No, I, I agree that this is definitely the best game that they've had on thus far. I mean, I, this this has a – Washington's a better team. I think we all agree with that. But it, it, like, like we said, it's a different atmosphere, different opportunity here to just kind of see – where Washington's at. Yeah, and I would agree. I mean, I think the one thing that the Pac-12 has been kind of lacking since their last playoff appearance in 2016 is just these, like, sig- like I wouldn't even say signature, but it's quality non-conference wins because I can mm-hmm. remember, like, years, like, I think it was, like, 2017 or 2018 when, like, Washington played Auburn. Like, oh, this is a year the Pac-12 gets a great non-conference win, and they mm-hmm. didn't. Then, like, 2019 when, you know, Justin Herbert it lost to Auburn in the, in the final seconds. They blew that lead. Uh, Justin Herbert got, I mean, I, I remember it like yesterday too, like Justin Herbert's ankle got hurt and like, yep. because he couldn't run the ball, uh, they got stopped and fourth down and the comeback happened. And then you just go down the line, even last year, Oregon and uh, or Oregon and, and Georgia. I know a lot of people are banking on Oregon to show out for that one, when Georgia being the juggernaut, they are just blew them out, out of the yep. water. So this, I feel like that storyline definitely helps Penix's case a lot as well. Uh, with even though it's Michigan State, it's still a power five team in the Big Ten, and you know it, it still breaks some perceptions of the Pac-12. Uh, mm-hmm. so that definitely could help. The best thing that happened for Washington in this case is Michigan State came back and beat Central Michigan. Yes, they ended up winning handily by the score standard, but I actually watched that game. Central Michigan played really well, especially in the first half, and made that a real game uh, going into halftime. So I, I, the best thing that for Washington in this case is that Michigan State won that football game. Yeah, I definitely agree. And on on, on a Central Michigan you note, know, like Bird Emanuel is oh a, man, he, he is, is so yeah, he's amazing. He is good. He's like if he can if he can just improve his passing, he will truly yes. be a, a juggernaut for Central Michigan. For uh, real. which is <laughs> which is yeah, he's just he's just so fun to watch, uh, for sure. But I mean, Bert Emanuel Jr. I mean, for for those older listeners, I mean, that's that that can't be fun to to hear. <laughs> that that <laughs> right. Bert Emanuel son's playing college football, so he's a special that. talent. <laughs> He is. I'm, I just I hope Central Michigan just keeps him, uh, and they keep yes. him healthy because because Lou Nichols, 
Uh, I had the chances to to watch Lou Nichols when he was in the Sun Bowl a couple of years ago, and just an amazing running back. But he couldn't yeah. stay healthy, so I just hope Emmanuel stays healthy because yeah, like like you said, like just a, a really special talent, you know. And just you know, if he if he's able to pass the ball, I just I just hope. I just hope that Jim McElwain is able to use him right in that scheme because yes. McElwain isn't the best with with uh mobile quarterbacks. Yeah. <laughs> uh Treon Jackson, Jackson. Every time I mention Treon Harris to Jackson, he uh kind of rolls his eyes and, and takes a deep sigh when like I don't think he was the problem. I just I just think he was a just a just a consequence of being in, in a pro style scheme, you know, yeah. when he just didn't fit a pro style scheme. Same thing with Bird Emanuel. I just hope Jim McElwain uses him well because that would be a disservice to the college football world if he does not use Bird Emanuel well. One hundred percent. But uh, that that being said, I mean Bird Emanuel, a player to watch. Uh, we we have players and games to watch. Unless you have anything final to remark in the Heisman uh, race, Bobby. One more thing, I would like to include DJ Uyangale. Oh, right. right. I, I am very, very high on Oregon State. And, and yes, there's that sentimental factor. I think I think people nationwide are cheering for Oregon State and Washington State to, to win this year. But Oregon State has a real chance to win the Pac-12. And DJ got a really bad rap at Clemson. And I think we're starting to realize that it wasn't his fault. I, I think that's been made pretty clear. Uh, because that game that he played against San Jose State uh, – not the, uh, the last Sunday. I mean, he was lights out. He was fantastic. And, and I, I'm really, really intrigued to see him moving forward this year. I think he's in a perfect fit and for them in that system. And, and like I said, I'm cheering for them, but at the same time, I think he's going to do really, really well. Yeah, I, I agree too. Like he's been, he's been great to watch and, and you know, he did get a bad rap. He did get a bad rap or at uh, at Clemson. And it's sad. Hopefully, Cade Club and he doesn't fall fall into the same thing. I think I think you right. can even say going back to Kelly Bryant. Kelly Kelly yeah. Bryant got a bad got a bad yeah. rap, which I, I I feel genuinely sad for Kelly Bryant because he literally took them to the playoff like the year before, and then Trevor mm-hmm. Lawrence comes along and people are calling for his head and yeah Kelly Bryant. So I I feel bad for Kelly Bryant too. So now we know that it it, it is not their problem. It is the system's problem. Absolutely, so, DJ though. I mean, it, it's amazing because. The Civil War now is a high is a game with Heisman implications. Uh, mm-hmm. The Oregon State, like li- literally every game in the Pac-12, will have Heisman implications, which is which is just great. We might get tired of talking about the Pac-12 in this podcast, but there won't be a Pac-12 to be tired to be tired right. of talking about right. next year. So we we might as well not take that for granted on, on the podcast. But I I agree. I'm excited for what DJ does in these games too. And or it's just a shame because. Me being a Rose Bowl enthusiast, I, I really, I really wish that Oregon State would have began the season last year ranked. I wish it would have beat USC to end that dreaded Rose Bowl drought because I think uh, they haven't been to a Rose Bowl since nineteen since New Year's Day of nineteen sixty five, which it's it's unacceptable. It's just it's just too sad to bear. That's quite some time. <laughs> it is. It, it it is. It's too long. I mean, they're not the only ones too with the drought right. like that. Uh, right. Minnesota. Minnesota was one that really hurt a lot too. If if they they only finished the season strong. They they would have ended, ended that drought. And I think uh, California as well. California hasn't been to one, I think, since, I think, 59, actually. So, uh, but that that probably won't – that probably will continue. <laughs> all, all those right. will probably continue with the, with the way that college football is. <laughs> but that being said, uh, going on to games of the week as we as we customarily do, this is a fun week of football, especially during the weekdays, mm-hmm. which as a, as a service academy fan, there's no service academy games on Saturday for me to tie to be tied up in. Uh, so I'm I'm excited. I'm excited for this. I mean, this isn't these aren't the games to watch. But I mean, Navy for me, I mean, Navy and Memphis on, on a Thursday night. I know I'll definitely be watching that instead of TNF Army UTSA on Friday, which is at first I was like, I'm like, man, I'm like, I definitely don't want to watch this game. But now after seeing UTSA kind of stumble through and I'm mm-hmm. kind of fascinated by this one. And then of course, Utah State Air Force, uh, definitely so so three so the three service academies playing um on weeknights but well, what's your first game to watch bobby for this week well i was really hoping illinois was going to beat kansas and i was going to lead with that but i, I got to go with lsu and mississippi state I, I i think we all expected lsu to start the season strong and and, and i don't think we should write them off by any means at all because they can definitely win the sec west this is their first test mississippi state's undefeated 
Uh, they're coming off a win against a uh, an improved Arizona team in overtime. Uh, so I'm really intrigued to see how this game goes because can LSU, yes, they bounce back against Grambling, but you, I, I would certainly hope that they would do that. They're LSU. Uh, so co- going to Starkville, I'm very, very intrigued by this because I think Mississippi State's a borderline top 25 team right now. So this is a really, really good test to go on the road in the SEC, play a good team, and to uh, prove prove themselves. And, and, and I, I, I firmly believe LSU will do that. Um, but there's also a very good possibility that Mississippi State proves a lot of people wrong in this game too. Rodgers, their quarterback, he can sling it. He's a heck of a football player. So I, I, I'm really intrigued. This is two good quarterbacks facing off right here. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. Um, and I, I'm not a big power five guy. So definitely I as crazy as it sounds to say, Mississippi State LSC was definitely not on my radar for this week. I mean, all, all of my games, except with the exception for one, actually, yeah, all of my games involve either FCS or an or a group of five team where like, you know, the the power five team is the afterthought of the matchup. But I mean, Will Rogers as well. And looking back, Mississippi State's always kind of given LSU problems. I, I always right. think about the first thing in my head, the opening game during the pandemic season, where I mean, KJ Costello threw for, I think, over 600 or close to 600 yards in, <laughs> uh, in Death Valley. So that scheme definitely gives them issues. And early on, while while the score for Grambling, you would have never been able to guess. Grambling hung around in the first half. Mm-hmm. Like they yep. they had um they had a lot to be proud of in the first half. And mm-hmm. I, I I don't think I've seen the wheels fall off faster in a game because before I knew it, it was it was seventy to ten when when Grambling held like a 10-7 lead in the in the first quarter. And I was like, what what happened? <laughs> like I, I guess they got really angry. I guess they really angered, <laughs> angered the beast. It was like the Ooh. same thing with the. Uh, I feel like it's like a common trend with with these HBC games since Power Five. The Notre Dame Florida or uh, Notre Dame versus a Tennessee State game where like Tennessee State almost was there, almost down like seven to six, and uh, going uh, at the end of the first quarter, like man, like Tennessee State showing us something. And then. Before you know it, it's fifty six to three, and it's wow, like that, that mm-hmm. you know, that that had, that ended quick, but that definitely is a uh, a huge game, and I feel I feel kind of bad for a guy like Will Rogers, who is often overlooked in the SEC when it comes to the quarterback play, and he puts up the best numbers. He's probably honestly, he's probably the most fun quarterback to watch in the SEC, Absolutely. but he still gets overshadowed just with mm-hmm. that system. So I, I I feel bad for the rap he gets, and hopefully he performs well against uh, against Jaden Daniels, um, in LSU. Absolutely. So going on to uh to my to my neck to my first game. This is the quarterback, but of a different type. Uh I have San Jose State versus Toledo at um uh, five mountain time. Um this game, oh man, like if you if you love great quarterback back play, great dynamic quarterbacks, if you want potentially I wouldn't say a preview of the New Year's Six, I guess, for San Jose State, because I think uh with their two losses, I think they're kind of eliminated from the New Year's Six if they, if they would win. Uh, but Toledo, Toledo, if they go eleven and one with a close loss to Illinois, and the American looks shaky as it had, or well, with the exception of Tulane, the American kind of, you know, looks shaky. Then Toledo is a very worthy uh, New Year's Six candidate. But DeQuan mm-hmm. Finn and Chevin Cordero, two dynamic quarterbacks, like this feels like a game that they should have saved for us in December for the Arizona Bowl or the famous Idaho Potato Bowl, than just being a random game at at the Glass Bowl in September. But I mean, if you want good quarterback play, uh, T- Toledo versus San Jose State is just the way to go. Uh, I, I mean, Daquan Finn got hurt at the end of last year, and well, yeah, at the end of last year, he kind of missed some games. And but Daquan Finn, when he's healthy, is so dynamic, so fun to watch. So and of course, like I mean, they almost beat Illinois. Not so. Right. I mean, the country is aware of Daquan Finn, so that one is for me that that's must see TV group of five fan power five fan, you know, everyone needs to watch that game. I think the really cool thing about that game too, is you have potentially each conference's player of the year playing in that game with Cordero in the mountain West and Finn in the Mac uh, to, like you said, really, really gifted football players at the quarterback position. So I agree that that game is really intriguing and exciting. I I, I think there's going to be a lot of points in that game. 
Yeah, I can agree. There, there definitely will be fireworks for that game too. And I, I, I don't know how the weather is in Ohio this time of year. So I don't know if that's going to play a factor for San Jose State traveling that far. But I, I mean, is is it's, is the weather even bad in this area? It, it shouldn't. Area? It shouldn't be too bad. I mean, I live in Illinois. I grew up in Michigan, so I'm used to, like, uh, like thinking about like when I was in high school, your games, the games like this time of year, you'd get down in the fifties, maybe the forties, maybe. So it, it it's it shouldn't be an issue. Okay, yeah. So I I guess I guess not then. I I know um I know San Jose State actually traveled to Western Michigan a couple years ago and they lost their road end of that mm-hmm. home and home, but they won their home end the last year. So maybe that's a factor. Maybe that 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 fifty or forty degrees, like you said, is cold is cold enough to uh deter the San Jose State offense. Potentially, I mean, it's definitely not what they're used to. That's for sure. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, Bobby, what's your what's your next game? I've been excited about this game uh, when I saw it come out on the schedule. And Western Kentucky going to Ohio State. Ohio State plays Notre Dame next week. Ohio State has not looked good at all thus far. I was at Western Kentucky's home opener against South Florida. I've formed a good relationship with their quarterback, Austin Reed. Fantastic person great Christian. He's just a fantastic guy. And he's a really, really, really good football player. I'm not saying Western Kentucky is going to beat Ohio State, but if Ohio State takes them lightly, this is going to be a heck of a football game because WKU's wide receiver Malachi Corley, he's a returning All-American. Uh, from There were a handful of uh, publications that listed him last season as a fourth-team All-American Coming in preseason, there were some people that listed him as an All-American this year. That, that Western Kentucky's got a really, really good offense. That if anybody takes them lightly, it's going to be a battle. So Ohio State better be ready. They better not be looking ahead to Notre Dame because Western Kentucky will give them a game. Yeah, I agree. And it's interesting, too, because watching the NFL today, I saw promos for big noon kickoff, and it was Illinois-Penn State. And I'm thinking to myself, like, Western Kentucky, Ohio State is going to be the better game. Like, why? Why isn't that? Right. Why isn't Fox putting the promotional juices for that one? But like you said, with Ohio State, I think it's I think it's interesting where Indiana is, you know, they they they're a tough team. They're a tough out for ranked teams like they don't win a lot of their games against ranked teams. But you bet that they're going to give ranked teams trouble. So like with mm-hmm. Ohio State, Indiana, like, I didn't think that was too big of a, of a red flag. Like it was a red flag for Ohio right. State and what they're known for. But against against Youngstown State, them only only being able to drop thirty five on Youngstown State, and I saw someone make the point where it's like it's not the rules if Army drops fifty seven on Delaware State, if Air Force or not, I, I don't think it was Air Force, but someone else, like, if like other teams are dropping 60, 50, 60 points on on teams, I think I think the problem is like you guys too. Uh mm-hmm. so I I I don't think Western Kentucky pulls out the the win, but I, I do think they they put um they they they. I guess give Ohio State a run for their money for sure. Like I I mean I'm excited for that one too. And, and it's a big spot for Western Kentucky and Conference USA being on Fox in front of the country uh to see. So Austin Reed as well. May, maybe we'll be talking about Austin Reed uh, as a Heisman candidate next week, uh, if he puts up a big enough uh performance on national TV. So I'm excited for that one too. I mean, I mean Austin the Austin Reed show is great. I, I feel like we just I feel like the country's just as a collective forgotten about West Kentucky after Bailey Zappi graduated. It's like, oh, mm-hmm. you know, that's that's it for them. But that's they're still going strong with like the same system. So mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, they're the Hilltoppers are fun to watch. And I'm glad Army doesn't schedule them anymore because that that was a very <laughs> that was that used to be a very stressful game for for Army fans. So I'm glad that series <laughs> is over. Uh, going on to my next game, um, uh, again, could it? Couldn't be more. Couldn't be any more different than your game. I have at North Carolina Central versus UCLA, and not because I think it's going to be close, but because I just I'm a, I'm a big fan of of the, one of the quarterbacks playing in this game. And no, it's not Dante Moore, but Davius Davius Richard of North Carolina Central. Uh man, if, if you watch a Celebration Bowl this year, you know that this guy is the real deal, and he is probably the front runner for the Black College Football Player of the Year. Uh, last year at 3,449 total yards, 40 total touchdowns, including 788 rushing yards and 15 touchdowns. He continued, he continues to do well on the ground. He, uh, he hasn't really had to pass the ball as much for North Carolina Central. He had a couple of easy wins 
last week against uh, North or Saturday, yesterday against North Carolina A&T in the Aggie Equal Classic. He had 95 rushing yards and I think two touchdowns. Uh, if he, I, I'm, I'm just excited to see what he does against a Pac-12 defense. That That's really how excited I am. Uh, UCLA's defense has looked pretty solid the past couple games. I know that Grayson McCall didn't have the best game against UCLA in week one. And then in week two, San Diego State, they don't have great quarterback play, but uh, but Jalen Jalen Maiden is is a pretty solid quarterback, and he was held in check by the UCLA defense. So I'm just I'm just excited to see how how Richard plays against UCLA in this game, and again could be, I mean this game's on the Pac-12 network, so I, I'm not gonna say this could be a celebration bowl preview for most of the country, but if you are able to watch it, especially on the West Coast, um, just you know, this definitely could be a look at Davis Richard before the Celebration Bowl. Uh, and they also have a um, they also have a national televised weeknight game against Morgan State, which is looking more and more like the MEAC title game. So mm. get your first look at Davis Richard against UCLA. And I don't think you'll be disappointed. I think a, a good thing to point out about this game, too, is UCLA at home doesn't draw a ton of, of fans. So it's not like they're going into some crazy hostile environment and UCLA tends to play down to the level of their competition. So I I think that this game can remain close for quite some time. And yes, UCLA is the better team. We all understand that, but there's a real opportunity here for uh, North Carolina central. Yeah, I agree. And I mean, you bring that up with um them like playing down the level of their competition. Like, I mean, the 2022 South Alabama game where South mm-hmm. Alabama was an ill-advised fake field goal away from beating UCLA and kind of bursting the bubble in their season. I, I just think it's just interesting how drastically the seat, the narrative could have changed for Chip Kelly, where Chip Kelly would probably easily have been on the hot seat if right. he if he lost to South Alabama, no matter what else happened in that game. Uh, and it's just great too because these games. I know last year uh, they played out Al- UCLA played Alabama State and they labeled it the Black Excellence game. So they're paying these schools a ton of money uh, to recruit in the area, allow them to re- recruit new students in the area. So yes, it's a series called the Black Excellence Games uh, to recruit in the area. They're bringing the bands, of course. And um, so I'm I'm looking at the there, there's not really much information. I guess in game entertainment, yeah. Okay, that I should have read that before, but uh, but yeah, like it, it's just great for uh the the HBCUs to go out west because it's really not an opportunity that many of them get, and again for the local crowd in California to see uh to see not Dante Moore but see Davius Richard. Absolutely, I mean, is it possible that he's the best quarterback in this game right right now? Not projecting, not projecting down the road, but right now he very well could be the best quarterback playing in this game. I, th- I think so too. I think it's very possible. And if you look at his track record, you look at in the celebration bowl, the quarterback on the other side that he outdueled essentially mm-hmm. Shador Sanders. Like, yep. you know, you know, I th- it's funny. It's funny how Shador Sanders is a household name and everyone, but not the quarterback that beat him for, for the celebration bowl. Right. It's just funny how things like that work out. I mean, it, it I, I don't like to say, to say like, you know, to say the Deion Sanders effect, but in in this way, it kind of it kind of is a thing because you know, yep. Davis Richard is not a household name, but Shador Sanders is. Mm, that's a great point, Omar. So yeah, that being said, tune into that one if you have the Pac-12 Network. Uh, I'll just say I'll just say good luck in finding that game. Uh, <laughs> so I I don't like to punch down and and, uh, and you know play on overused jokes, but I truly do mean it because I would think I would hope that out here at West Texas, there in El Paso, there's a way for me to get the Pac-12 network with Tucson being five hours away. But I I don't think there's a way for that for me to to get that. That's crazy. But, uh, <laughs> it, it's it's crazy and it's saddening. So I guess before we go further on down that road, Bobby, uh, what what's your next game to watch? I'm going FCS FBS game here as well in the Pac-12, and I think this is a game where the FCS team can win. And we saw them defeat an FBS team last week. I'm talking Idaho at Cal. Cal played Auburn this past Saturday night, last night. Very, very close. Cal's offense is questionable, let's just say. Or they they look they didn't look very good against Auburn. 
they look pretty good against North Texas, but FIU looked really good against North Texas. So maybe North Texas defense is atrocious. Well, that, that's a topic for another day, I guess we could say. But Idaho just went to Nevada and destroyed them. Uh, walked away with $400,000 and a huge win. So side note, when I was at Grand Valley State, we beat Michigan State in basketball. We walked away with a nice paycheck too. And then I can that's I could talk the rest of my life saying that I beat Michigan State, but beside the point, beside the point. But this game here, Idaho, I, I just saw today was ranked as high as third in the country now in the FCS standings. Uh, so this is a really, really good football team going to Cal. And that Cal better be ready for. It. Yeah, well, you read my mind, Bobby, because for all those reasons you mentioned, but also too, this is a, a classic Pacific Coast Conference matchup. So I was about to get—I didn't even think of that. <laughs> emotional, yeah, emotional nostalgia. Talk about how in this final year of the Pac-12, we're having a matchup that takes it back to its roots. So for that reason too, and yeah, Idaho as well. I mean, I, I just so with Cal, with Cal, I, I think I think they're a hard team for me to read because I think. They're just a, they're a consequence of just it being early in the season and you're trying to form out like, okay, this team beat this team, but it's still early because like California dropped 58 on North Texas. And for me, I'm like, wow, like that is that is really good. This offense is rolling. I, I mean, uh, Jaden, Jaden Ott is a, one of the best backs in the country, which he very well might be. And then next week they at home, they, they falter on offense against Auburn. But then again, like that North Texas team also lost to FIU, who like I asked you, I'm like, do you think FIU is any good? So it's just all over the place in Turley Dash. Yeah. What we do know is, yes, this this offense struggled last week against Auburn, an Auburn team that's like still kind of trying to get back in their groove. But Idaho, as I mean, Idaho, they'll be they'll be motivated. They, they definitely will be motivated for sure. Same thing with like the 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 you know, the Nevada game, like the motivation edge was on Idaho. Uh, the no, the motivation edge is on Idaho side, this, this game against California too. And I mean, Giovanni McCoy at quarterback is a great quarterback. He won the Jerry Rice award last year for best freshman of, of in all of FCS. He doesn't make many mistakes. You want a risk averse quarterback. Uh, he only threw seven picks last year. This year he's completing 73% of his passes. So I think he's, honestly the right quarterback to to win a game like this a risk averse quarterback who's smart with the football because you need tur- turnovers can kill you as a as holy cross boston college i mean matthew sluka had an amazing game but it was a turnover in the end that did that did him in and, and i mean it wasn't his fault that's just the way he plays i mean if you saw that game he rolled out you know tried to try to make something out of nothing and then he got stripped from behind that's just the way he plays ball but right. Um, that that's not an insult to him, but you know, a risk reverse quarterback helps helps you win these games too. But surprisingly enough, doing some research, which I'm gonna put in a write up for this game, a, a nostalgic and kind of sappy write up for the, about the Pacific Coast Conference. These two were in the same conference from 1919 to 1959, but from 35 1935 to 1959, they didn't play a single time, despite being conference members, which is. It, it's just really weird how that how that works out with these old conferences. I think I think I saw something where Georgia LSU have met less than forty or fifty times despite being in the SEC for almost a hundred years. So it, it's it's just interesting how like these conference alignments work out. Which I mean, it's proof that these conferences are too big. So <laughs> that that's all the proof you need. It's only getting worse too. <laughs> exactly. So that that being said, before uh, I enter my old man enter or you know yells at cloud. <laughs> Uh, rant for the day i think i think i got on one of those rants a couple days ago about, about being an old man on a on a cloud ranting but uh going going to my next game this game i don't expect it to be close but i just think it's just something that's cool and great for college football um we have vmi versus nc state on the cw uh so this game is available in a hundred percent of households cbs has or sorry the cw has made that clear that it's like hey if you have an antenna we, you know, you are you are in a market with a CW station, and that's great for a program like VMI. Uh, just a little rundown on VMI's program. I mean, VMI has had one winning season since 1981 that came in 2020 during the pandemic. Um, that's that just kind of sums up the state of this program. Of course, it's a military, you know, a military, a senior military college. Uh, so the situation's different. The college situation's different. They they try a bunch of different things. They've ran option before. They've done air raid recently. They're back to a pro style type scheme under Danny Rocco, who coached uh, Richmond 
uh, a few years back and had some had some good seasons. But VMI, they play good defense. They they beat the defending uh defending Pioneer Football League champions twelve to seven in Davidson. Even though Davidson looks like a mess this year, I, I don't know what happened to Davidson, but they they they're just awful. Um, then last week against Bucknell or yesterday against Bucknell, they lost twenty one to thirteen. The defense is led by Evan Eller, who has twenty tackles in two games. And uh, at quarterback, they have Colin Ironside. Which if you're gonna go to a to a senior military college, I think Ironside's a great last name to have. He's averaging uh, over t- or close to 250 yards per game in those two games, which it, I don't think this game's going to be particularly close, but it's just great for VMI to get a national network TV spot. And you best believe that I'll be that that'll be the game that I'll be watching primarily on my TV. That'll be the game that I throw in the frozen pizza for and uh, just have a blast. That That is an amazing opportunity for them. Like you said, I mean, yeah, they probably don't have a chance, but it's such a huge deal for them to say, we're going to be on TV in a hundred percent of American homes. I mean, that, that all these teams in the PAC 12 can't say that. So what, what a, what a great, what a great opportunity for them, man. That's awesome. Exactly. So, I mean, I, I just hope, I just hope they score, but with a lot of these yes, games, yeah. I just hope in a game like that, they score because I remember last year when uh when Valparaiso came down to New Mexico State for for a makeup game, and you know they they scored early on, uh but that was really the only moral victory of the day because it was clear. I mean it was a non scholarship FCS team against a FBS team. It went about as well as you would think, and yeah. it was you know I sat with the Valparaiso fans and I wanted them so badly to score or to score a touchdown, but it it just wasn't in the cards that day. <laughs> you got to cheer for teams like that, that just getting the opportunity, like it, it's such a big deal for them. And, and yeah, I mean, you just, I, I agree with you. You just hope they score. Yeah. So, I mean, VMI versus uh, NC state two Eastern time, um, 12 mountain time for me, uh, you know, just be there. I mean, you could, you have, there'll be plenty of opportunities to watch whatever game, whatever type of game, ABC and Fox are broadcasting, but you, you don't get many opportunities to watch a team, from the SoCon on, on a big stage like this. So mm-hmm. I, you know, I highly advise you watch it, but uh, I, I have one more game of this, Bobby. Do you have any more games um, to watch this week? Well, we, we hit on the uh, Wisconsin Mich- or the Washington Michigan state game, which is another one I'm excited about because I potentially might go. We'll, we'll see how it all pans out for me there, but I think Iowa state and Ohio is another interesting game. Uh, I actually believe Ohio is going to win the game. I think Ohio, Iowa State has not looked good. Uh, I, they're coming off a tough loss to obviously their in-state rival, rival Iowa, and Ohio's good. And hopefully Curtis Rourke can play. That that's going to be key. Obviously, is if he can go, if he's all right. Uh, but I, I'm intrigued by this one. Yeah, I, I'm intrigued as well by by it too. I think uh, so. Curtis Rourke did play last week against Florida Atlantic, or yesterday against Florida Atlantic. Um, didn't I, I think he might not be 100 percent because didn't look like his, his usual self. He had 203 yards and and uh two picks to one touchdown for the Bobcats. Uh, hopefully he's 100 percent really, but uh, but yeah, like I I definitely think Ohio has what it takes to beat Iowa State, and Iowa State that's another program with just so much going on with everything that's happening, and they get this they get the they get the Cyclones in Peden or, or in Athens, Ohio at Peden Stadium, which is definitely is definitely huge. Anytime you you avoid having to go to a Power Five environment, so I'd have to agree with you that I got to make my upset special list of the week, uh, just like you, so. Uh, that one will definitely be on my list for sure. Um, it just comes down to to Curtis Rourke though. If he if he's hundred percent, right. which I think so. My opinion, uh, Ohio. I'm not sure if he transferred, but Ohio is a more than worthy backup in Dante Miller, who took or sorry, not Dante Miller, C.J. Harris. Excuse me, C.J. Harris, who just who took over the program, uh, a couple a couple or sorry, not a couple years ago, but last year when when Rourke was out for the year, I, I think he's more than worthy as a backup. But it's kind of struggled this year. But I, if, if it was up to me, I would start Harris rather than a a uh, not a hundred percent Curtis Rourke. But 
again, I'm not being paid to make these decisions. I'm just a talking head. So <laughs> that, that's just my two cents. But uh, but yeah, I'm excited for for this one. And I, I hope the Bobcats do pull it off. I also hope the Bobcats win the MAC because they haven't had a MAC title since 68. So um, so hopefully this year is the year. You know, hopefully this year is the year for the Bobcats. Uh, they, they feel like the Cubs of college football for me yes. uh, at this point, <laughs> not winning a conference title. But uh, going on to my last game, I have a uh, St. Thomas uh, beating or not beating. Sorry, that 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 might be my upset special was St. Thomas playing Harvard at Harvard. Uh, and this game is just a game that's so important for the Pioneer Football League. And the Pioneer Football League gets overlooked because they're a non-scholarship league. They don't really have a geographic identity. It's just a bunch of schools where basketball, either basketball drives a bus or it's like a, an extreme circumstance where the conference they're playing in just ceased to exist anymore, which is the case for Maris and or where you're you're literally too good to play in your conference. So you get kicked out of D3 and have to go D1 like St. Thomas did. <laughs> so it, it's just it's just it gets overlooked for those reasons. And the PFL has just had a very, very horrible year so far. Like the defending champion Davidson is not only to O and two. They lost to a school that moved up to D2 a couple of years ago in Barton. San Diego, the team that that most people know about because they had a long win streak because Jim Harbaugh coached there, because journeyman quarterback Josh Johnson uh, graduated from there. Uh, they lost to Colorado Mesa last week. I'm not sure if you saw Bobby, but the uh, they had a lineman throw throw a touchdown yes. pass off. The yes. Field, which is just it, it feels like a mad lib. That feels like that's like one of the funniest. I think that's one of the funniest like events to happen on a football field. Not not if you're a San Diego fan, but that's just. I, 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 I just can't stop laughing. It just the, just the thought of that happening. But they lost to Division II Colorado Mesa, and um, they're in the middle of a hazing scandal, um, which is not funny, which I should really stop laughing. Um, I stop laughing about the, the field goal. But they're in the middle of a hazing scandal where half the team was disciplined. So it's just not a good year for any team. It, it, well, not for a lot of the, the usual good teams in the PFL. St. Thomas is included in that. They lost to South Dakota last week. And the overwhelming kind of reputation that the pfl gets is they just can't win non-conference games because of the scholarships or i guess non-conference games against you know stronger stronger programs which is harvard game provides a good opportunity because harvard's opening their season they have no games under their belt as the ivy leagues usually do and last year that kind of bit them they kind of that kind of bit them in the rear end because last week they opened the year at home against merrimack and merrimack took them to overtime despite being in the NEC, being um, in their second year D1. So I can see a similar situation kind of playing out for, for Harvard here, where they kind of struggle out of the gate in their first game. St. Thomas last year went 10-1. and one. They were in my top 25 poll. I'm going to have to kick them out after we record this and do my poll because they did lose to South Dakota by three, by 24. But this is just an important an important game for the, for the conference because – the perception of the PFL is just not going to improve anytime soon if they don't win games like this. I, I have a great story to share with you about St. Thomas. I was a D3 head coach in the same conference that St. Thomas was in. And I remember them coming to uh, the college I was at to the, to our place and just beating the brakes off of our school. And it was just one of those things where it's just like, holy smokes, these, this is different. Like, how are these guys D3? <laughs> but, but like you, like you said, it, it, they were, I mean, at the division three level, they were unbelievable. And so it, interesting to hear about Harvard waiting on the, the scheduling aspect. I I'm that's bizarre to me that why teams would do that. It's the Ivy League. The Ivy League usually starts during week three. So it's That's a conference true. wide That's thing. That's true. So That's true. It does affect the I mean, it affected Harvard last year. Like they looked flat last year in their first game against Merrimack. Um I I think it's mostly a light slate. I think everyone in the Ivy League mostly has a light slate, except for Yale, who has who has the task of playing Holy Cross, a pissed off Holy Cross team. Um, for their first that'll game. be a good football game actually it, it will it will i mean the series is definitely evening evening out because i think holy cross had like a six and they they, they they've lost a lot of games in the series and won less than 10 i'll just put it at that including when i was a kid i remember one of the holy cross games i went to with my dad just happened to be when mike mike mcleod um ran for 256 yards and like 40 carries and and my i remember my dad turned to me and was like is anyone going to stop this guy <laughs> so that that's i guess that's just like a picture in my head of how lopsided the uh the holy cross yale series was but um 
but yeah, that's usually what the Ivy League does. I mean, for for their reasons, and there's been calls for them to to be in the playoffs, which like I can't. I can't argue against that. I used to be able to argue against that, but when they're sending their student athletes to Japan for uh for an exhibition game, there there really is no good argument that I can come up with for why you're not playing in the playoffs. So I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> but that was my last game of the week, Bob. Do you have any more games? No, I think I think I'm good. Uh, there's some good ones. Let's just say that. Yeah, we can go on and on and yeah, on and on. We about, could. <laughs> uh, about, we can find something good in every game this week for sure, I'm certain. Uh, there's like plenty uh, something I've noticed like there's like plenty of old like conference rivalries being being yes. lived. And like if there is if there if we had like if we had time, we can go over each one and just like just be nostalgic and sappy for each one. But I that's not the time or place for this. So <laughs> <laughs> um, but I mean before we end, Bobby, uh do you want to plug anything? I know, I know I mentioned before TNT college football podcast. I mean, I love listening to it on my drive to work uh, for sure. Now that I have my own office, I've been listening to it even more now that, that I have my own office at work, you know, I have to share. So um, I, I, I love, I love the work you do. I appreciate that Omar. Thank you. And you, like you said, it's uh, the TNT college football podcast. You can follow on Twitter or X, whatever you want to call it now at TNT college foot one. You can find my show mostly on Spotify, uh, I'm not as high tech with you with this video stuff. So <laughs> maybe down the road, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I, I, I appreciate those kind words of you listening and everything. I, I, I try to bring a different kind of aspect to things being a former coach, albeit in a different sport, but I still kind of understand that world that I played. So I get it too. So it's, it's, I, I, I love being a part of the college football community. It's just a great, great, it, there's so many great people. Yeah, I know. It's definitely it's definitely a blessing, like uh for sure. Like I told my mom too. I forgot how I got I got I mean this came to be, but just like talking about like like doing podcasts and like networking. I told my mom like, man, like I used to, I use Twitter X like my LinkedIn. That, that's just how I yes. form connections with people. <laughs> like that, that that's my that's my LinkedIn. But um I you mentioned the coach aspect too. Like uh I remember listening on Tuesday, going back to work after the uh the LSU game um and i remember like i really liked what you said about uh, about butch jones and brian kelly like you know like i i'd never heard you like speak it speak that way like not that it was anything bad but there's like there's like definitely that fire as a coach i was like wow like, like he's making some really good points like passionate about it too like so if you haven't listened to that pod to that uh, that episode i think it's like i think it's like your week one college football talk i was like i was like I was like wow like you know this, this is this is great like this is great for any any coach too like so I, I enjoyed that as well. And I mean, yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Um, but until next time, everyone, thank you for joining. I'm still trying to hear back from Jackson. So I don't know if next week we'll have another guest host or not. But if we do, I mean, if we do or if we don't, one thing's for certain, you will see, you will see hardware next week. And until next time, everyone, peace, love, and soul.